Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Arias, and today we're going to be breaking down Ginkgo Bioworks Q4 and full year earnings report, as well as giving my takeaways from their conference call. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy this type of content, and leave any video suggestions and feedback in the comments below. And without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start out with the raw numbers. For the full year 2021, they had total revenue of $314 million, made up of $133 million from Foundry and $201 million from Biosecurity. Foundry revenue for the year beat their expectations from their SPAC presentation, while Biosecurity comfortably beat even the revised up expectations from midway through the year. They posted a full year adjusted EBITDA loss of $106 million, but oddly enough they posted a profit in Q4. This was mainly due to the profitability of their Biosecurity revenue. They added 31 new programs to Foundry in 2021, which is the second most important metric that I'm tracking, exceeding SPAC presentations. However, they did not announce any new successful programs, which is the most important metric from my point of view. However, we should expect this to be lumpy. Considering this, I wouldn't even be worried if there were no successes in Q1 or even Q2. However, if we were to go a whole year without any successful developments and no comments addressing it by management, then it starts to get a bit worried. As for guidance for 2022, they guided for 60 new programs, which is roughly doubling over 2021. And I'd love to see them hit 62 new programs to make it a true doubling year over year. They guided for 165 to 180 million in foundry revenue, which is in line to slightly below their SPAC presentation of 175 million. They also guided for 160 million in biosecurity revenue in 2022, even though most all of their K-12 school testing contracts end in June, and there will be little visibility going forward, but we'll address this in a moment. There are two other things I'd like to highlight before we move on from the numbers. First, this slide shows their transition away from related party revenues over the past year. As you can see, the dark green third-party revenue is growing significantly as a percent of mix. For third-party revenue in 2020, meaning revenue that came from companies that Ginkgo does not own equity in, made up just 29% of foundry revenue. However, this percentage increased to 58% in 2021. Related party revenue, which makes up the remainder of the foundry revenue, declined in turn from 71 to 42%. Their Q4 year-over-year -year numbers showed a similar but more drastic shift from Q4 of 20 to Q4 of 21. This is a massive blow to the common but flawed bear case in my opinion, as Ginkgo is quickly shifting away from the related parties, which is a key to the bear thesis. For more on this, watch my last video on Ginkgo linked below. This slide also makes some good points. By the way, all of these slides are from the earnings presentation, which I have linked down below along with all of the other main resources used in the making of this video. On the top, they showed how they beat all of their guidance for the year, beating both of their original and revised program count by 7 and 1 programs respectively. They beat their foundry revenue outlook by $13 million and demolished the biosecurity original guidance of $50 million as well as the revised outlook of $100 million with a $201 million number. On the bottom half of the slide, you can see how well diversified they are in the areas of customer size, partnership type, and industry. This is another benefit of running a platform because turmoil in one industry would not lead to the complete collapse of their company. Moving on from the numbers is a warning I have for you. I think there's potential for massive amounts of FUD to hit Ginkgo in the coming months post-earnings, and here's why. In this quarter, management made a change to employees' performance-based RSUs, or restricted stock units, to qualify the SPAC merger to allow the shares to vest. This caused a $1.7 billion stock-based compensation charge to come through on this quarter's operating statements. However, this is a non-event in my opinion because every single one of these shares was accounted for in their original documentation for going public. There's no due deletion from this event and there's still roughly 2 billion shares outstanding. The $1.7 billion number is further misleading because this is calculated using a roughly $13 share price and the equivalent number at today's prices would be about half a billion dollars. I only mention this to arm you against the Fudsters that will no doubt see this massive stock comp number and then find some way to justify Ginkgo's impending bankruptcy as a result. Just know it is merely a counting change and this has all been accounted for since the beginning and no new shares have actually been issued. Next up, I want to mention the biosecurity business. Biosecurity was the source of a ton of outperformance for the year in terms of revenue and profit, but let's take a step back for a moment and talk about what exactly quote unquote biosecurity is. As I understand it, biosecurity, despite the cool name, really just means having the capability to both do surveillance testing for potential novel pathogens appearing in the population, and then having a nimble and scalable enough testing apparatus to quickly stand up the ability to do mass testing in a population to isolate those who have it and slow the spread, hopefully before the really dangerous ones become widespread. These capabilities would obviously be unbelievably valuable in the event of another pandemic. Unfortunately, with globalization, the number of pandemics may only increase over the next few decades. However, it was about 100 years between the last two, and while this is clearly a good thing, it forces me to discount this business massively. Of course, there is potential for the use of this asset in non-pandemic testing, but to be conservative, I still discount this business due to the lack of clarity surrounding it. 
This will not be one of the primary drivers of value for Ginkgo in my opinion in the long term as the testing businesses are going to be inconsistent and have a rather small total adjustable market compared to the long term opportunity from the utilization of synthetic biology. However, in the short term, biosecurity may be able to recoup some of the development and infrastructure costs in the form of profits as they generated $71 million in gross profit in 2021, $47 million of which was in Q4. While I will be pleasantly surprised if this business line turns into something consistent for Ginkgo, I'm not counting on it as part of my investment thesis. Next, I want to talk about some of the key points that CEO Jason Kelly cited as challenges to scaling. He first talked about, and this was my main takeaway from this segment, the need for continued development of new technologies that will allow Ginkgo to scale their foundry tests per day and keep their costs falling. He compared this to Moore's Law, where chip companies would look out over the next few years they would identify each sector of technology that was needed to keep Moore's Law scaling and categorize if there are known solutions being optimized, known solutions that needed to be proven, or a category where solutions are not known. This would catalyze a development cycle going all the way back to academic circles looking for solutions to these problems. These technologies would go through the development and commercialization process, and the end result is Moore's Law that we all know and love. They have known ways to improve their foundry and keep costs falling, and throughput massively increasing, mainly via automation and miniaturization. These will drive incremental but continuous improvements in foundry. However, the other section, which will drive step changes in these foundry capabilities, is new biological tools, like that of FGen. These will take time to be fully utilized, however, they can drive massive improvements. For example, this data point here, which, because this is a log graph, is 1,000 times greater number of strains tested than the average where they are hovering around 10,000. Bringing these technologies forward to keep scaling rapidly will be one of the most difficult challenges for Ginkgo in the coming years. However, with management's singular focus being on this, and with examples of exponential improvement like Moore's Law showing improvements like this to be possible, I have confidence Ginkgo will be able to continue the necessary cost declines. Another lesser problem that they bring up is that their rapid scaling may break other parts of the supply chain, as you could imagine. One example they gave is that with the recent success in the animal-free meat space, there is a shortage of pilot-scale manufacturing facilities. No doubt other bottlenecks like this will develop over time, however, Ginkgo has the necessary focus and resources to overcome them. The final challenge, which represents one of the larger threats to Ginkgo, is that they are reliant on third-party companies to successfully commercialize the strains that Ginkgo has developed. This could definitely hold Ginkgo back in the long term if companies that they work with fail to do so. On a different note, I wonder if Ginkgo has a clause in their agreements that if they choose not to commercialize a product and thus waste all of Ginkgo's work, then Ginkgo gets possession of the asset and can resell it out into the open market, perhaps to their biggest competitor. I have no idea if this is in some of their contracts, but this would give companies massive incentive to use the tech developed by Ginkgo. Finally, while these will be massive challenges for Ginkgo, they will be even bigger challenges for competitors who are making the same aggressive investments that Ginkgo is now. As Ginkgo scales further, the barrier to entry only grows. Just imagine, it took Ginkgo 8 years to get below the by hand cost for lab work. Why would any company make the choice to make that investment now, rather than just use Ginkgo to do the work for them? Even if it only took them a fraction of the time to get below the by hand cost by copying what Ginkgo has done and using some new advanced technologies, that would still be an extremely hard long road for that company. And Ginkgo is only accelerating away from this, making it still an even better choice to use Ginkgo's platform, as their costs will be drastically lower long term. This is why I think Ginkgo is in such a good position. They are the leader in an unlimited TAM market. What more could you ask for? Finally, before we get to my conclusions, my takeaways from the call. First, one of the things that Kelly reiterated was their plan to scale hundreds of programs in the short term and thousands of programs over the long term. In the short term, he thinks they can scale with basic operational improvements in terms of workflows and such, and this should get them to their program goals this year. Long term, they think that Codebase will allow a single person to do multiple simple programs on their own, which will allow their program count to scale much faster than headcount. This was an interesting comment as it was something I had suspected to be true, but it was good to hear it straight from the CEO. Another interesting comment came in response to a very important question, which is, how can investors tell how much value companies are getting from Geekos platform? It is clear as day that they can get more throughput, but how can we tell that this leads to better chances of success? Kelly responded to this by saying that this is the exact conversation that they have to have with every customer to convince them to come onto their platform. He has to convince them that they will be better served by spending their money developing on Foundry with Codebase rather than doing the R&D internally. Thus, a good interim indicator of customer value, they think, is how many programs continue to come on to the platform. Of course, long term, the indicator is how much success there is, but this is a difficult process and takes time, therefore we cannot derive much from it in the short term. They also talked about the FGen acquisition. FGen boasts what they call nanoliter technology reactors, which is a scaled down way of doing pooled strain testing. This is one of those step change technologies that can catalyze drastic increases in throughput for Ginkgo. 
I expect Ginkgo to continue to snap up small acquisitions like this that have specific technologies that they could benefit from, and they said as much on the call, especially with valuations being hit as they have of recent. The next point brought up was not particularly positive, and that was the net present value of per program, which they said at $15 million in their SPAC presentation, but they said this is down year over year, mostly due to market conditions. However, they are still in the early stages of their platform, and more data is really needed to come up with a firm number for this. The final point I will make is that while they refuse to provide any specific guidance, they essentially guided that there will be not a massive expansion of related party revenues, and thus foundry revenues will continue to shift towards third party, twisting the stake in the heart of the bear case that Ginkgo is a fraud of the century. Finally, my conclusions. Ginkgo's numbers are solid, and they continue to execute on their goals. It is good to see related party revenues continue to shift to third party revenues, and that it weakens the bear argument. However, it is not inherently good or bad in actuality because related party revenues are still revenues. Another thing to keep in mind is that the huge stock based comp number is already taken care of and the standard amount of stock comp is still expected to come going forward. In the big picture, Ginkgo still has the work cut out for them, no doubt, but with a nearly limitless upside. That's what gets me really excited about this company going forward. In terms of what I'm going to do with Ginkgo stock, I have about 2.5% of my portfolio in Ginkgo Bioworks and about 10% of my non-Tesla portfolio. While I have paused adding for now, I will continue to add once I have built up a cash cushion so I can sufficiently buy the dip if there was to be another one, as we've been getting the past two days. Thanks for watching. What do you think of Ginkgo Bioworks and their numbers this quarter? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks again for watching and have a great rest of your day.